all through scripture, God is concerned with the human heart. After the Noah and the Ark genocide narrative, God says that he will not attempt to solve problems that way again because it didn't deal with the real problem, which was sin in the human heart. You can't punish a change into happening there. Something deeper has to happen, something that God begins to work toward when he chooses Abraham and tells him that in him all families of the earth shall be blessed. God later says in Ezekiel 36, through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. This hope of a blessing that began in the promise to Abraham and was seen more clearly in God's words to Ezekiel, we see brought to fulfillment in the work of Jesus, who still cares about the human heart. And as we see in this passage, he also cares about the external things that affect the inner workings of the heart. It's Luke 12, 31 through 22, or through 21, and I'm reading from the NRSV. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Jesus is asked to get into a family dispute about an inheritance. Now, normally, the, other brother, the older brother in a situation like that would get two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger brother would get one-third. It's kind of sad that things haven't changed that much in the world. There are still issues of inheritance that can bring out the worst of conflicts in families and destroy relationships forever. Jesus, though, declines here to get involved in this family feud, though he does offer some words of warning about greed. This is usually called the parable of the rich fool, but were any of the rich fool's actions really wrong? You know, not necessarily. He was very good at what he did. He worked hard at his farming, and he was very successful at it. Hard work that produces an abundance is not an evil thing. Making a good living is not wrong. It is not evil to get a big paycheck. So, really, so successful is this person's work, in fact, that it led to his second actions. He increased the size of his storage. Not necessarily a bad thing. He didn't want to let anything go to waste, and like so many years before, Joseph told Pharaoh, sometimes you got to save for the hard times that are going to come. So saving in itself really is not bad. It's seen in scripture at times. And I, I really, what I was drawn to thinking about this was that time that Jesus talks about the foolishness of starting to build a tower when you don't make sure first that you have enough money, money to finish building what you start. It's a simple illustration that we have to plan ahead and we have to look beyond the moment sometimes in the way that we manage our resources. Not doing so is foolish. And celebration is not bad. Eating and drinking is seen often in Scripture and big meals are not bad things. Jesus visits a lot of places where large meals are served and hey, he even made the wine for the big wedding that one time. The basic actions of the so-called rich fool are not the problem. The attitudes which guided him are the problem. Working and achieving and saving, those things aren't bad at all. Selfishness, though, in the course of his few statements here, the guy uses the word I six times and the word my five times. There is never one moment where he thinks about anyone else but himself. And Jesus 
spoke to a crowd who saw in their understanding success was a blessing from God. They would have seen a bumper crop year as one in which God had just been especially good to them. Harvesting and storing and celebrating this, those are not bad things. It's just that the guy was leaving something out in his life. The people of God were supposed to think about others, to share, to consider others who may not have the resources or the opportunity to produce as much as he had. They were told way back in Scripture to leave the scraps in their fields for the poor, to share from the abundance of their blessings with those less fortunate. This guy did none of those things. Jesus calls us to love God and love others as our two rules from which all other rules are derived. This guy seems kind of oblivious to the existence of God or the existence of anyone else. He loves himself and would never even pause to think about anyone else. You know, Luke is the gospel that tells us more than any other about Jesus' concern of the, with the problems that wealth can lead to. G, Luke had the background of being a physician. And his background as a doctor just made him sensitive to the physical needs of others. He, so he doesn't want us to forget what Jesus had to say about those kind of things. In this little narrative, wealth isn't the problem. Wealth for its own sake and the dangers of greed that such wealth can lead to is the problem. The idea that you never have enough and that you have to hang on to every single thing and that you're always worried about the future making you hang on even tighter, that's the problem. The idea of leaving the scraps of the harvest behind for the poor was really reflective of a number of things. First of all, it did provide for the poor, and God was making provision for those who had nowhere else to go. That was very true. But it was also an action that reflected faith. If you have to harvest and hang on to every scrap that your field produced, it was a sign that you alone were responsible for your future, and you didn't rely on God at all. Leaving some behind was the act that reflected that you lived by God's blessing, and he was your provider. So you didn't have to be afraid to leave some behind for others, because God would keep on taking care of you. You know, giving is always an act of faith. The rich fool kept it all, celebrated just for himself, and decided to relax and enjoy all that he had. He forgot that there was more than this life, and his life, unfortunately, was coming to an end. All that he had piled up had helped no one, and now he would have no say over what was done with it. I feel like that this is like reading about Ebenezer Scrooge without the redemption turnaround at the end. And the guy sounds a little bit like Dickens' description of Scrooge. Dickens wrote early in the the story, A Christmas Carol, of Scrooge, that he was a tight-fisted, hand-at-the-grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. You know, that's Scrooge, and he doesn't sound that different from this guy who just held on to everything. Jesus described this guy's attitude and actions as failing to be rich toward God. That's what was lacking in his life. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? Well, I I was looking this up, and even though it's only in a few English translations, the simplest possible translation of that phrase, phrase would be rich in God. To be the foolish one is to be the one who became rich with a lot of money, but never became rich in his relationship with God. Being rich in God is going to bring out a lot of love perspective on how we handle our resources. I always like John Wesley's way of seeing our discipleship of resources, expressed by him as work all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I think that kind of perspective is guided by a love for God and being filled to overflowing with the love that comes from God. When we receive his love and then return some of that love back to him, he pours out so much more love into us that it just overflows into the lives of the people around us. You work, you are blessed, and you aren't wasteful and foolish, so you save. But you also have your eyes open to what God is doing around you and the people on his heart, and then you're able to give. You are free to give because you know God is the provider of blessings, and you can trust that when your heart is being led to give. 
you know that he will take care of your needs. I, I've read that people will talk about this passage and then tell you what you're supposed to give to. I think that would miss the whole point of being rich in God. You could follow instructions and give to what someone tells you to give toward with no experience of God at all. I think that just shows us that we have to have enough of a relationship with God that the Spirit of God can guide us in the stewardship of our resources. It's not bad to be blessed. It's not bad to save and plan ahead. And it's not bad to have celebrations in our lives. But it is bad to leave God out of the discussion and do all those things without him. If you want God to be involved in your resources and guide your giving, rest assured, he will. The clearest times that God has communicated with me in my life have been over money issues. They also became the times that set me free. I was always told that you cannot outgive God, and that is so true. To me, it feels like God's kind of competitive in that way. I really secretly suspect that he just likes to mess with me on that issue and prove that he can give more than I can. This passage is about giving, but the point is about getting closer to God. I guess that I would first like to say, don't let fear of being led to give keep you from getting closer to the Lord. Just learn to trust that God won't lead you in any way that he won't be able to bless you and provide for you. I guess, too, that some people try to just keep their finances locked out of their spiritual journey and pretend that God doesn't care about our resources. Yet he does care about them because they affect his main concern, our hearts. What kind of hearts do we hope to have? There are two quick illustrations that, for me, describe how I connect to all of this. The first is from a book called Taking Flight by Anthony DeMello, and it's just a little parable that he tells. And his parable goes like this. Two brothers, one a bachelor and the other married, owned a farm whose fertile soil yielded an abundance of grain. Half the grain went to one brother and half to the other. All went well at first, but then every now and then the married man began to wake with a start from his sleep at night and think, this isn't fair. My arrangement with my brother just isn't fair. My brother isn't married. He's all alone, and he only gets half the produce of the farm. Here I am. I have a wife and five kids, so I have all the security I need for my old age. But who will care for my poor brother when he gets old? He needs to save much more for the future than he does at present. So his need is obviously greater than mine. With that, he would get out of bed, steal over to his brother's place, and pour a sack full of grain into his brother's granary. The bachelor brother, too, began to get the same attacks. Every once in a while, he would wake from his sleep and say to himself, this this simply isn't fair. My brother has a wife and five kids, and he gets only half the produce of the land. Now, I have no one but myself to support, so is it just that my poor brother, whose need is obviously greater than mine, should receive exactly as much as I do? Then he would get out of bed and pour a sack full of grain into his brother's granary. One night, they got out of bed at the same time and ran into each other, each with a sack of grain on his back. Many years later, after their death, the story leaked out. So when the townsfolk wanted to build a church, they chose the spot where the two brothers met, for they could not think of any place in the town holier than that one. See, I I love that story because I want to have a heart that is so confident in God's provision for me that I am freed always to have my concerns be focused on the needs of others and to be so trusting of God's provision for me that I'm not worried about my future. I always am looking to see what difference I can make in the future of others. And and the second illustration really that connects me to this passage is really from life and actually the life of our church, or at least one brother from among us who has already gone home to be with Jesus. Dan Mamey, years ago, Dan Mamey was concerned about Y2K, that time when there was the fear of that impending computer glitch that everybody believed was going to bring catastrophic problems and be a real danger to our economy. Dan, like some other people, but in his own unique way, he stored up food and had a bunch of food stored in the basement in case there was a total disaster breakdown of things. And there were people who actually made jokes about Dan for storing up that food. The problem was they were completely ignorant of Dan's heart. Dan wasn't storing up food for himself. 
Dan worried that if those food supply problems came, that there might be people in the church and people he cared about who needed food. And he just wanted to be prepared if something bad happened to help everyone that he knew. See, Dan knew what it meant to be rich in God. Dan wasn't saving for himself. He just wanted to be prepared in any way he could to help someone else. I want a heart like Dan, Dan had, just a heart that sees the opportunity to save and be prepared in the context of being a blessing to others. We are blessed. So let's give God praise for that and be thankful. But let's also see our blessing as an opportunity to learn ever more what it means to be a blessing to others. Because that's when we are rich in God. It's not about money. It's about what's in our hearts. Can we pray together? God, help us to be rich in you. And that means we need to be filled up with you in our hearts. You entrust a lot to our care, and you bless us in so many ways. Help us not to see those things selfishly. God, there are things that are given to us to enjoy and to celebrate, to share with our families and friends. But God, there are also things entrusted to us for the future, and that's true, and we want to save and be wise. But we also, God, each have unique opportunities to be a blessing, to minister to others, to be an encouragement, sometimes even to to jump in and be a rescuer when your spirit leads. God, help us to not just to, to not be afraid of getting too close to you because we're afraid of what it means to give, to release, to, be, to let go of things. We are tempted to worry. We're tempted to anxiety. We're tempted to hang on to everything. God, help us to just be reassured in our hearts by being filled up with you that we have nothing to fear and we don't have to grasp and, and hang on to everything We just have to get close to you, and you'll show us how to save, how to give, and you will bless every step of the way. Help us to learn to trust you. Help us to live in your love, and help us through the overflow of that love to be a blessing to those around us. God, set our hearts free, free of fear, free of anxiety, and free of that need that the world puts on us to hang on to everything that we can get our hands on. Set us free and fill our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to end with a few verses from Psalm 107 and make it our blessing for this week. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. To make it our blessing for this week. May you find a great many things to be thankful for as you reflect on how God's love has been poured into your life. May you know the deep peace that comes from realizing that he is meeting your spiritual needs with positive blessings. And finally, may you find that when you stop and think, you see more and more God's grace at work in every aspect of your life.